I'm reading from Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to verse 17. I'm reading the ESV version. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Woo! We are talking about a powerful passage today. <laughs> all right. Good to see you all. My name is Koen Prince, the pastor here at uh, Vineyard. And we are continuing our True Story series today. It's a 17-part series, but we're up to uh, part 11 now. And uh, we're talking about really the, the, the bigger story of the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, going all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, we're talking about how we were designed for good, then damaged by evil, but now through Jesus restored for better. And we're just coming out of a five-week sort of part in that series where we explored the life and the ministry of Jesus and of course his death and resurrection and then um, uh, onwards sort of to the fourth block in that if you can go to the next slide to the fourth block in that diagram that we're using just to, to give a give people a five minute summary of the gospel um, and we're now sort of in the arrow from restore to better to send out to heal together <laughs> uh, because if we want to begin restoring this world we first have to really come to grips with and understand how jesus has restored us for better so we just explored how jesus how jesus did that but now we're trying to understand what has changed now what has happened in us and so this is sort of a four-part um um yeah chunk in that series last week Matthijs talked about grace today I'm talking about identity next week Frank will talk about the already and the not yet of the kingdom these are all in Romans 8 and then next week I'm going to talk from Ephesians about the church so today about identity how has our identity changed through what Jesus has done for us identity is such a hot topic in our time it's such an important world where so many generations, if you'd, if you'd ask people like, who are you? Uh, they would just ask, answer with their first name, perhaps their surname, refer to their family as a sense of identity, maybe their profession. But today we, we're making it so far more complicated. We want to understand who we really are. Suddenly, who am I? has become a really, really big question. And there are three ways that you can kind of answer this question three directions you can look at to find your identity the first one is by looking outward when we look outward to answer this question who am i then the answer really becomes i am who others say that i am identity in this way becomes more of a performance you can be the cool one you can be the very smart one most of you are uh, you can be the super fit one some of you are you can be the woke one, the nerd, you can the can't wait for the weekend to begin one. You can be the rebel, you can be the fashionista. You can also choose a very Christian performed identity that you come across as very holy and very passionate. Whatever your church context really appreciates. But outside approval for a sense of identity will always, in time, fall up short. Essentially, it's a mask, it's an, it's an avatar, it's a performance, it's a, it's a play, it's not real, it's made-believe. And in the end, this sense of identity is circumstantial and is very fragile. It only lasts for as long as you can keep up appearances 
or as long as people are interested. And so we need to, and many people have this sense, we need to look somewhere else to answer the who am I question. And so the second way that people would look for a sense of identity is not outward. Who cares what people think? You have to look inward. Over the last two decades, the primary way to understand the self is through the idea that every person has a unique core of feeling and intuition that should unfold and should be expressed. In other words, the true self is the inner self and that needs to be discovered. So this is an identity that's not performed, but it needs to be discovered. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be expressed and then celebrated by others for you to live happily. This is being called expressive individualism. And there's a few problems with it. Firstly, if you look inward for a sense of identity, it puts an enormous pressure on people to sort of create their own happiness. It's depleting. When you've only got yourself to rely on for a sense of meaning and identity in your life, it can be exhausting and has led so many people to anxiety and to burnout. Looking inward for a sense of identity can become an endless search for, uh, with no clear answers. Secondly, if you look inward for that deep sense of identity, inevitably this will lead to a very self-focused and egocentric life. What we first call individualism as a, as, a, as a way of thinking in the West has now become hyper-individualism or radical individualism. And thirdly, this way of understanding the self really leads to a narrowing in morality. You know, because not everything that's freely chosen is also necessarily right. So just looking inward for a sense of identity and meaning also has its problems and has its limitations. And so again, we have to look somewhere else. So what do you do if you can't look outward for a sense of identity and if the the inward identity also falls short, what do you do? Here's the good news. As Christians, we can look up. We have not a performed identity, not an earned identity, not a discovered identity, a received identity from God. I am who God says I am. I'm not who others say I am. I'm not who I think myself to be or discovered myself to be, which can change from this day to the next day and from this year to the next year or a season. I am who my creator, God, says that I am. It doesn't rely on the approval of others. It doesn't rely on how you feel about yourself. It's imperishable, it's unshakable. Whatever you do, whatever you say, however you feel, there's nothing that can take this identity away from you. You are a child of God. And actually, the word that Paul uses to express this, this received identity, is actually not a child of God. He says you are a son of God. And this is not meant to exclude women. (laughs) You're like we'll, we'll use children. We'll, we feel more comfortable to use children and and sons and daughters, but what Paul is trying to express here through saying you are sons of God, which includes the women as well, is something very powerful. I'm going to try to explain that. To our um, no, I did that. Um, it has. It's, so what he's trying to say here, the son of God is has got both a Jewish and a Roman connect, connects to both the Jewish and the Roman background. So in the passage we've read, there are many connections to the Exodus story, uh, where God liberated the people from Israel out of slavery and to kind of give them a new identity and then send them on the way to the promised land, guiding them and everything. So he, he really set them apart for his purposes in the world. And in Exodus 4, God calls Israel his firstborn son, so that firstborn son or that sonship identity meant something in the uh, Jewish um, historical context of the Old Testament. Paul uses Exodus language to explain what has happened to us in Christ as well, how we are liberated from slavery to sin, how we are led by the Spirit onwards to the promised land. Paul even echoes 
a warning that Moses gave the people at the Jordan River. He said, on this side is death, and on that side is life. Choose life! <laughs> he kind of mimics that language, even in the passage that we study. And then he confirms that just as Israel was called the firstborn son, so we, men and women, the new people of God, are adopted as sons. But through his word, the use of the word adoption, Paul's also making a clear connection to the Roman context. He was writing to the Romans in Rome. And slavery was a very, very common uh, thing in the Roman world at this time, especially in Rome itself. It is said that up to 33% of the Roman world um, consisted of slaves. And sometimes when the master of a household would take a particular liking in one of the slave boys, he would have the option of making him like a biological son in his house. He would be able to adopt him and give him the status of a son. Interestingly, um, this is actually very common among Roman emperors as well. So it's known that Emperor Augustus had adopted Tiberius and that the later Emperor Claudius adopted Nero. These are all four emperors that reigned during the lifetime of Paul. So he was very aware of this. And of course, the people in Rome knew this concept of adoption. And so from both contexts, the sonship identity stands in contrast to the slave identity. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. With the sonship identity received instead of the slavery identity should also come a sonship mentality instead of a slavery mentality. When we became believers, we received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is testifying to our spirit. You are a child of God. You are a son of God. If it were just up to us, we'd probably live out the sonship identity with a slavery mentality. And I think some of us may still be doing that unconsciously. In your head, you know that you're a son, but in your heart, you still feel like a slave. My prayer today is, and I felt this happening already when we sang the name of Jesus over us and we talked about healing. And when we were singing that song, I, I, I felt some of that breaking off. And, I, and, I, and I'm praying that through this message, the last bits will, will break off over you of that slavery identity because you have a sonship identity. You've received that. And the Holy Spirit is confirming that to you even today. So in the remainder of this message, I'm going to look at the three purposes of that sonship identity, which is an invitation to intimacy, a call to vocation, vocation and a promise of inheritance. Now I'll tend to show this kind of contrasting the sonship mentality to the slavery mentality. So the first purpose is an invitation to intimacy. And to emphasize this, Paul uses the word Abba. Now, again, he's writing to people in Rome. And he's writing in Greek, which is the, the English of the time, basically the, the international language of communication. But most likely, the, the people that lived in Rome knew Greek and knew Latin, which is their more common language there. But the word Abba comes from Aramaic, which is spoken in the uh, world of Israel at the time and in Syria. It's not a language known to them. And it's a word that expresses an intimacy. It's a, it's a different form of the word father. It's best translation, translated as papa or daddy. If you're British, it's papa. Which suddenly makes it more formal again. So just go with Papa. <laughs> so as a son of the house, you are invited to relate to the God who created heaven and earth, not just as father, but as 
papa, as daddy. And it's likely that the first Christians in the Greek-speaking world were gotten, have gotten familiar with this word Abba. Because it was introduced to kind of express like the, the words that you have to relate to God, they, they, yeah, they, they fall short. So here's a word from a different language, Abba, which Jesus used as well in the, um, in the Lord's Prayer. And this expresses a more intimate connection to our Father. Because we're not just called to call him Father in his formal way, but Daddy, Papa, in a more intimate way. And so it's likely that they were actually familiar with this word so that Paul could just use it like that. Now imagine that you're one of those slave boys in a Roman household that's adopted to be a fully legal son of the house, a son of the master of the household. Can you imagine? It would take some time for the slave boy to realize he is now a son, that something has changed in his status. It takes time to go from yes sir to yes dad. It takes time to feel comfortable sitting at the family table for dinner instead of eating the leftovers in the kitchen. It takes time for the boy to understand he's invited to rest in the presence of the father instead of always being busy. Because the invitation of the father is now come and be with me and not come and serve me. And I think for some of us, we, we may know this to be theologically true of us, but still we have such a hard time understanding that God is an, an intimate and a loving father. And this so often has to do with childhood wounds where our fathers were not able to express the heart of our heavenly father to us in the most appropriate way, in the best way. We now know that this even distorted neurological pathways in our brains so that we when we hear daddy or hear father we we subconsciously think angry demanding fear better please because otherwise i'm punished things like that these things may have shaped your heart and i pray that today you may receive healing there because we are invited to relate to our heavenly father as sons to call him Papa, to call him Daddy. Our status has changed from slave to beloved son, and the Holy Spirit is confirming this to us and helping us to heal. A second purpose of this sonship identity is a call to vocation. We're not just saved out of slavery, but we're called into a new vocation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, If anyone's in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Tom Wright in his commentary on Romans 8 says this, As new creation people, we are standing on the threshold between the present age and the age to come. And we are called to be agents of new creation in the present. So we are called to be a living testimony of God's great restoration plan. We are called to live as sons and daughters of the Father in such a way that others look at us and get an impression of who the Father is and what he is like. We are called to be sort of mini Christ. That's what Christian means. We are like small versions of Christ in this world, living as priests, living as prophets, living as kings, connecting people to God's presence, speaking truth from God's word into this world, stewarding his resources, caring for this world, ministering in the power of the kingdom. As the people that belong to the future, that belong to new creation, we are called to bring the newness and the restoration of that future into the present. That's our new vocation. And that's connected to our sonship identity. Last, there's a promise of inheritance. In the same way that God took the people out of slavery in Egypt, set them apart in a new vocation, in a new calling in this world. He was leading them onwards to the promised land. And in the same way, we are liberated from slavery to sin, set apart for his purposes, and by the Spirit, 
led onwards to an inheritance. Let me read it again from the passage. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Contrary to popular belief, the inheritance and the hope for the future this passage is talking about is not heaven. It's not about going to heaven when you die. The kingdom of God, the gospel, is about heaven coming to earth. It's about God's redemptive purpose for this world to make all things new. And we are called to partner with him to bring about this new creation, to see the future breaking into the present. And so we are partners in God's great restoration project. And let me ask you, who is going to have more heart for the father's business? The son or the slave? The son of the owner or the employee just does it for the money in more modern terms? Who's going to do whatever it takes to see the father's business flourish? Who's going to come in early and stay late, make sure that everything is in order? Who's going to think in terms of what can I bring instead of what's it doing for me? Who's going to really care about the progress and the profit and the well-being of the business? It's the son that truly carries the heart of the father's business because he sees it as his business, as his inheritance, as his future. And the father is inviting you to care about his work and to pray for it, even to suffer for it, like a son, like an heir, not like a slave. And the promise is that when you share in the labor and the suffering, you will also share in its glory. And so I'm going to close our message off today with a number of contrasting statements between the spirit of slavery and the spirit of sonship. Um, there's this book, Spiritual Slavery to Spiritual Sonship, written by Jack Frost a number of years ago. He already passed away, I think, in the late 90s. And uh, it's beautiful. Um, and, um, if you want to borrow it, there's, there's one copy available, uh, so be quick. Um, and in one of the chapters, he's giving... 20 contrasts between the spirit of sonship and the spirit of slavery, and I've kind of summarized them into shorter statements that I'm just going to read out to you, and I'm going to ask you to, to kind of listen with your eyes closed and with your hand on your heart to kind of check in yourself if you are relating to our God with a, through a spirit of slavery or through a spirit of sonship. So I'm just going to read them out. I'm going to ask you to listen with your heart, listen with your eyes closed, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. How he speaks to you, the Holy Spirit, is through conviction, not through condemnation. Yeah? If you hear condemnation, that's the Satan. If you hear conviction, a sort of yearning, a sort of... Sometimes, it's how in Dutch we say, like putting the finger on the sore spot, <laughs> so it may hurt a little bit, but that's the Holy Spirit's conviction. And I think he's going to speak to some of us through this. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask the band to come up and uh, kind of prepare for the worship. The spirit of slavery sees the father as a taskmaster. The spirit of sonship sees the father as unconditionally loving. The spirit of slavery is self-reliant. The spirit of sonship depend, um, depends on the father and is interdependent on the rest of the family. The spirit of slavery lives by the love of law. The spirit of sonship lives by the law of love. The spirit of slavery is insecure, strives to act right, tries to earn God's blessing. The spirit of sonship is at peace in the Father's embrace. 
Spirit of slavery is addicted to approval and acceptance of man. Spirit of sonship knows it already has the Father's approval. Spirit of slavery serves to impress God and others. The spirit of sonship serves out of gratitude um, God's unconditional acceptance. Spirit of slavery pursues Christian disciplines out of a sense of duty. The spirit of sonship finds the Christian disciplines a pleasure and a delight. Spirit of slavery believes it must be holy to be accepted by God. The spirit of sonship wants to be holy out of a love for the Father. The spirit of slavery has a low self-image and an attitude of self-rejection. The spirit of sonship feels positive and affirmed by the Father. The spirit of slavery is shut, cannot receive love and seeks comfort in counterfeit addictions. The spirit of sonship finds true comfort in times of quietness and solitude, resting in the Father's presence and love. The spirit of slavery relates to others through competition, rivalry, or jealousy of others' success and position. The spirit of sonship relates to others through humility and unity and celebrates the success of others. Spirit of slavery, when faced with conflict, resorts to accusation and denial of own faults. But the spirit of sonship is relationship-oriented and seeks to restore others through love and gentleness. Spirit of slavery sees authority as a source of pain and is suspicious of any other authority except its own. The spirit of sonship is respectful and honoring of legitimate authority and is teachable. Spirit of slavery sees correction as a threat. The spirit of sonship receives correction as a blessing. The spirit of slavery is guarded and conditional in its ex- expression of love. The spirit of sonship expresses love freely. The spirit of slavery sees God's presence as conditional and distant. The spirit of sonship enjoys the close and intimate presence of God. The spirit of slavery lives in bondage to fear, mistrust and self-reliance, but the spirit of sonship lives in the condition of liberty. The spirit of slavery lives as if it doesn't have a home. The spirit of sonship is at rest in the safe harbor of the Father's love. The spirit of slavery is fired by spiritual ambition. The spirit of sonship doesn't have anything to prove and isn't striving after position, power, or prestige. And finally, the spirit of slavery, for him this future is uncertain. For the spirit of sonship, the future is secure. If one of these statements, or many of them, have touched you and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I want to ask you to stand up and to put your hand on your heart because I want to pray over you. Holy Spirit, come and heal our hearts. Come come and heal our minds. Restore what is broken. Through things that people have said, through experiences with our own fathers and mothers. Confirm to us the spirit of sonship that we receive in the true Son, Jesus. It's through you that we cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. 
And in Jesus' name and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm breaking off any spirit of slavery in this room. Over everyone here that's living under the spirit of fear, that's living under the spirit of slavery, of duty. We break it off in Jesus' name. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Restore unto us the sonship identity that we have received, not through our own performance, not through our own earning. The identity we have received through faith in Jesus Christ. Make your healing go through this room and touch everyone here. Holy Spirit, you know us through and through. You were there from the beginning. When we breathed our first, you were there. You've walked with us through life. You know where we're hurting. You know where our pain points are. You know where our brokenness still is. We invite you now to come and heal. Hallelujah. We would love to pray a more personal prayer over you. And so we've got a whole beautiful prayer team that's getting ready now to send it aside and just receive you and pray over you. Pray a more personal prayer over you. Perhaps another way that you could respond now is just by singing the next songs out loud. And let, as you are, like, this is what David would often do <laughs> in the Psalms. He's like, like my soul delight in the Lord. So even when, when you're experiencing now this sort of like, oh yeah, this is this is a heavy thing in my life. This is a burden. It's like I'm I'm, I'm feeling some of that brokenness. Just sing out the truth of God's word. Sing out from that sonship identity. This is where you'll heal. This is where he'll kind of confirm that to you. So either go and receive prayer or sing with your heart and soul and spirit out loud to our Father. Amen.